in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and then initiating the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation here in Velour, and starting Asia's first rehab institute that gives women, like my friend here, Sujata, hope. This picture shows Sujata with Dr. Guru Nagarajan, the social worker in the Rehab Institute. But why does she go to the Rehab Institute? She's a school teacher in a government school not far from here. You see, she has no hands. And so it is with this historicity that we stand at the crossroads of our centenary knowing that it is the context of our calling that makes a difference. Because as revolutions transform the way we think, we act, and we live, we seek new questions that are relevant to our time. The challenge is therefore to continue to speak the language of the marginalized and the poor, to continue in the pursuit of professional excellence, compassionate care, inclusive and holistic health, and education of the highest order. In short, to inspire, to empower, and to transform. And as we look ahead to the next 100 years, we as an institution dare not wish to be complete, but we wish to be replete, replete with hope, with expectation, and possibilities as we enter a new century in service of our nation and humanity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to invite to the stage to give us a few words about the Martins, Dr. B.S. Ramakrishna, former head of GI Sciences CMC, currently director, gastroenterology, SIMS Chennai. Good evening, everybody. It's, it's a privilege to talk about my teacher and mentor, Professor Martin, and uh, Dr. Mini Martin. And it's appropriate that we have an oration in their name. As uh, Dr. Anna was saying, Dr. Martin and Minnie were the father and mother of uh, gastroenterology and GI pathology in CMC. Uh, Dr. Martin was, uh, as, as we heard, batch of 1955. Uh, Minnie was from the same batch. Uh, and uh, we used, when we were students, we used to call them Maxi and Minnie because of the, the, their respective heights. And uh, Martin was a charismatic person. He was, he was, he was, uh, he was really uh, an intellectual, a man of extraordinary intelligence and ability, and he could master most things very quickly. Uh, as a result, he rose to be one of the father figures of gastroenterology in the country. He was actually kingmaker in terms of uh, creating directors of several institutions in gastroenterology around the country. Uh, he was, for two terms of four years each, secretary of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology. Uh, he was the president of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology. Now, besides his interest in gastroenterology, he, he set up this very a uh, productive unit which invited collaborations from around the world and that was the Welcome Research Unit and which I think uh, continues to some extent today I think with, the, with, with a lot of involvement from other people like uh, Cherry. Uh, what many people do not know is that he was probably one of the earliest endoscopists in this country and I remember that when I was a final year medical student in 1974 is when we got the first upper GI endoscopes. They were made from ACM, they were the ACMI endoscopes, uh, American Stethoscope Makers Incorporated, and they were superb optics, I don't think which are surpassed by anything nowadays, uh, but the, the rest of it obviously was a little more primitive. Uh, <laughs> having said those words, I think, I think we have somebody extremely appropriate to talk, talk and I think uh, he's going to be introduced. So, thank you.
to introduce our speaker for the evening, I'd like to call Dr. Ashok Chako, former head of GI Sciences, CMC, currently director of gastroenterology of Madras Medical Mission, Chennai. I'm really honored to have been given this opportunity to introduce a friend of mine, Dr. Nagesh Reddy, an icon of endoscopy in our country. As I was thinking backwards, I remember Nagi starting off as an endoscopist with magic hands. Then many years later, some years later, he became an astute academician also. And now, I think he's an entrepreneur with golden fingers. So he's really a Sarva Kala Vallaban. There's no doubt about it. And he has taken uh, India to great heights in the arena of endoscopy. Dr. Nagesh Reddy is currently, for those for the gastroenterology community, we all know Nagi, but there are others here for this meeting. And so I need to officially introduce him. Dr. Nagesh Reddy is currently chairman of Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad, India. He graduated or did his MBBS from the Karnur Medical College, the MD from the Madras Medical College, and DM from PGIMER, Chandigarh. His main area of interest has been in the field of GI endoscopy, particularly in therapeutic pancreaticobiliary endoscopy and innovations in transgastric endoscopic surgery. But I think he has covered uh, most of the field of new innovations in this area. He has given several orations, including there are so many, but I will mention a few. Francisco Roman Oration of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, Dr. Panir Selvam Memorial Oration of the Malaysian Society of Gastroenterology, the Huibrikse Oration of the 15th International Symposium on Pancreaticobiliary Endoscopy, Sir Francis Avery Jones Professorship, St. Mark's London, the Peter Gillespie Oration, Australia, etc. He has also published voluminously. He has published over 477 papers in national and international peer review journals, contributed uh, chapters in seven international textbooks of gastroenterology and edited three GI endoscopy texts. I don't know where he got so much time to do all this. He, he is on the editorial board of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, Digestive Endoscopy, World Journal of Gastroenterology, etc. And uh, he has been elected to numerous fellowships. Some of them are uh, American Society of GI Endoscopy, National Academy of Medical Sciences, Philippine Society of Gastroenterology, Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. He is also the recipient of a DSC from the Nagarjuna University. He has been recognized for all these achievements by these several societies. He received the B.C. Roy Award from the Indian Medical Council, the Padma Shri Award, from the Government of India in 2002 and more recently the Padma Bhushan Award from the Government of India in 2016. He is also the Secretary General, he was the Secretary General of the World Endoscopy Organization and the past President of the World Endoscopy Organization. I have, can I introduce him? I have great pleasure in inviting you, Nagi, to deliver this Dr. Martin and many
Thank you, Ashok. I am first of all extremely grateful to the organizing committee for choosing me for this oration. In fact, I realize that there are many, many eminent endoscopists in this country who could possibly fit in here, but uh, it's uh, a big honor for me to be a part of this oration. When you are asked to talk on your journey on a particular field, that means you have come to retirement stage. <laughs> because looking back at what happened, so hopefully this won't be for that for me, but uh, uh, I'll try and to start off with the background. I think uh, as Rama earlier told us, uh, Martin, Professor Martin was an icon. In fact, we were literally frightened of him when we were students in uh, both MD and DM. And when he used to come as examiner, we try and see, read about tropical screw the night before and, <laughs> and he'll never ask a question on tropical screw in the exam. <laughs> and that was, and of course, Mini actually was a colleague of my dad and he used to always tell me what an extraordinary pathologist she was. So it's a bit, uh, a big um, honor and I think I'm very humbled by giving this opportunity. To start a little with my background, I did my MBBS in Karnul Medical College in 79. Uh, at that time, gastroenterology was not a big specialty there at least and although endoscopes had just come in um, and physicians were starting to do these endoscopes, they were considered, uh, the physician endoscopists were considered actually plainly diagnostic, inaccurate, contemplative and important because we just used to see the lesion, sometimes give a wrong diagnosis and nothing used to happen. So endoscopy didn't have much reputation. It used to be a spare part for the physicians and in general endoscopists at that time were considered carpenters, not very intellectual. And then I actually joined uh, Madras Medical College where I did my MD and at that time uh, the hepatitis B virus uh, just before had actually been prominent and uh, Dr. Bloomberg got the Nobel Prize for discovering this at that year. In fact, he visited uh, uh, MMC and uh, I think Palni will remember, Palni also was there at that time and uh, it was a big inspiration uh, to sort of see him and then I got, uh, I sort of fell in love with hepatitis B virus at that time. I started working and that's actually led me into gastroenterology. Dr. Madan Gopalan who was actually the professor uh, then advised me that I should go to PGI and do DM because they had a very peculiar rule of lo locals and non-locals in MMC at that time so I couldn't possibly get into MMC. So I went to PGI, continued this work. Uh, I was very interested in hepatitis B and my pathway was towards hepatology. And uh, after some time actually, in fact, my first paper, very naively, on I sent it to Lancet and for some reason they accepted it. Uh, it was actually quite a thrilling experience because you start, those days used to get, I don't know, Rama and Ashok, you know, used to get reprint requests, you know. People used to send small reprint requests and used to get hundreds of those. I was wondering why people can't actually take Xeroxes of this instead of asking for reprint requests all the time. So, you get hundreds. so I was sort of very involved and during that time, I think Naresh will know this, Sheila Sherlock actually visited uh, PG, I did uh, visited and I was uh, uh, actually looking after her. So she was um, also quite interested. She told me after you finish your fellowship, you should come and join me, join her and also be a part of editing her book. So this was a big honor. I was very excited. But what happened was after I left PJ, I joined the Nizam's Institute of uh, Medical Sciences and uh, we just started a new department of gastroenterology. A large number of new endoscopes were bought. I sort of started fiddling with that and I realized that uh, probably my hand-eye coordination was okay, that I was probably a better carpenter and less intellectual skills to be a hepatologist. So I then thought I should concentrate on endoscopy for a career very long, very long back, 30 years back. I was also influenced by another mentor, Dr. Jang Badu Dilavari, who was of course an extraordinary endoscopist and uh, he had a certain style which I think many of the uh, students at that time uh, sort of fell in love with. So. Uh, I had this calls from Sheila Sherlock writing letters when I joining, when I was coming and I had to tell her that of course I have changed my interests, I think uh, I am better suited for endoscopy. Uh, Professor Sheila Sherlock, I don't, for those who know her, she was a very stiff lady, she was uh, also very difficult to deal with. Uh, I remember that after several years later I was in one of the European meetings and I had to do a workshop and uh, I had this very difficult CBD stone on the screen, I removed it, I was very happy, came out and in the corridor was Professor Sheila Sherlock coming. And you know Sheila Sherlock, I thought she'll say good job and all that. She just looked me up and down and said, after all you've become a technician and walked off. <laughs> <laughs> she had 
a very low opinion of endoscopists and of course at that point of time endoscopists were really technicians, there's not much uh, intellectuality in endoscopy. And, um, but anyway, I continued, but at that point of time endoscopy uh, in, in the 80s, late 80s was very primitive and you can see here that it was also more intimate, you're looking in, into the eyepiece with the patient and uh, of course you have to demonstrate, there used to be a lecture scope again some of older people remember the lecture scope, which you never used to see. Ashok, you remember, we never used to see the light was not enough, we can't see. Always take it out at, you know, in between and then show it like this. Just uh, not a very interesting thing to do. So, uh, what happened then was uh, something that I'd like to show you. This was, uh, Anthony is here, so uh, this was a Hong Kong workshop. At that point of time, there's no organized teaching of endoscopy in India. We just used to learn by ourselves, fiddle around a little with the patients and start doing procedures. Um, I think it's greatly improved now. Over the last 30 years, there's been a dramatic change in Indian environment in terms of teaching endoscopy and so on. The, the endoscopy that we used to uh, all go to was this, uh, actually, the workshop in Hong Kong. This was 1985, my first workshop that I went to. And this was a workshop which actually also gave us an idea of how uh, endoscopy could be done, seeing it on the big screen, the big inspiration. This was Peter Cotton in 1985. And you can see this very primitive endoscope. In fact, in fact, it used to hang from the healing, but it was very heavy. It used to have a camera, which okay, they couldn't hold it, so it used to hang it. The view was very dark. Uh, in fact, even Peter, with all his skills, was struggling to get into the papilla here. Uh, but in spite of all this, this was a still a big inspiration. For many Asian endoscopists, in fact, this was the starting point of endoscopy. We'd watch this and we'd think, okay, maybe we can do some of these procedures. And that's how it all started. Uh, for me, this was a starting point. When I went to the first endoscopy workshop in Hong Kong, you could see all these big figures, Peter Cotton, Michelle Kramer, Kis Hubriski, on the big screen there showing all this. And we were sort of... Uh, um, it was a thrilling experience actually to actually watch them at that point of time and there are many many endoscopists all over uh, Asia Pacific region who became endoscopists because of this workshop and for me it was again a great experience to be called as a faculty subsequently for this uh, workshop in fact you can see I still have a lot of hair at that point of time and uh, we uh, I think this has been a, a good learning experience for me. Uh, the first uh, ERCPs consistently were demonstrated was by Itaru Oi from Japan. Uh, Itaru Oi was a pioneer in ERCP technology techniques and he was the one who actually showed the world that you can very safely consistently do ERCPs. I also learned a lesson when I went through his life. I had an opportunity to meet him recently, very tragic life. He became very famous, unfortunately he became an alcoholic with that and uh, sometime back in alcoholic stupor, fell under a train, lost his legs and is now in penury, living in Tokyo in a very bad shape. So looking at that, I realized that some of the pioneers in each field can go into a different uh, mode, especially if they're not properly nourished. So I think this is a classic example. Uh, the first therapeutic endoscopic procedure that was done was this endoscopic spintrotomy, a very revolutionary procedure at that time in 1973, simultaneously by Klassen and Demling in, in Germany and Kawai and Nagchima in, in Japan. We used to look at the literature and we used to have great um, um, wonderment for these individuals at that point of time. And later when I came to know them, there's little behind stories which were very amazing. In fact, Klassen and Demling uh, did the first uh, ERCP spintrotomy in the nurse who had to see because nobody else was willing to undergo an ERCP. So this was a gastroenterology nurse who had a CBD stone, they removed it. And uh, for many years, nobody knew who actually did it, whether it's Dembling or Klassen, because they locked the room when they did it. The room was locked, and uh, Klassen later told me he actually did it, it was not Dembling, because Dembling was not so good at endoscopy. <laughs> and then Kawai and Nagachima's, the Kawai and Nagachima's first ERCP in Japan was a medical student, because somehow he was doing medical rotation in gastroenterology, so he agreed, nobody else would agree. They did a spintrotomy, and uh, again, you can see this became a most often quoted page. Everybody says Kawai did the spintrotomy. Actually, Kawai never did endoscopy. He never knew how to hold an endoscopy. It was Nagachima who did it, actually. And because of hierarchy system in Japan, Kawai's name came first. And uh, uh, Nagachima died, actually died a bitter man because nobody realized that he was the one who actually did endoscopy. But endoscopic spintrotomy was very revolutionary at that stage, 73. When we were in our first year middle college, there were paper news and all that on this. And um, um, 
In fact, the Claude Ligary, who became very famous ERCP's endoscopist, when he did his first endoscopic pentrotomy in France in 1974, the hospital actually kicked him out of the hospital because they felt it was too revolutionary. He should not be doing this. So that was a stage endoscopy at that, that time. And this is, again, a picture I got from Klassen. This to demonstrate that even seven years after doing a spintrotomy, he was showing this picture around to all his surgeons saying that, look, you can do spintrotomy safely, the papilla is still open. Otherwise, the surgeons in Germany were very much against this at that point of time. And again, to me, it was an extreme pleasure to be associated with, uh, to be associate editor with the classic textbook of GI endoscopy, which Klassen edits. And I learned several things when we were editing this. We used to have these uh, teleconference meetings, I mean, editing this textbook, and, uh, the, and Klassen would decide everything. Your role was just to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, and he'll, it's okay, that's fine. Everybody agrees now. So, the thing, so that's how it was. Right, uh, this was. Uh, Nip Swayandra is another great endoscopist with whom I had association. In fact, in 1979, he did the first endoscopic biliary spintrotomy. And uh, he was a great human being also. He had several uh, uh, things to his name. In 1970, again, you can see that. I was fairly young looking at that time and I spent some time with Nib and not only did I learn about endoscopy, the art of endoscopy, but the art of human touch was very important. In fact, he would every day in the evening, the new recruits or new trainees who came from Asia and South American countries, he knew they couldn't, they didn't have enough money to have a good dinner, so he would regularly take them out for dinner himself after the work was over at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the night. He had this uh, amount of feeling for his uh, uh, students. Uh, he was associated with many, many new uh, devices and so on, many of which we are using now. One of the greatest endoscopy, ERCPs in my opinion is Keyes Hubriski. I went to watch Keyes uh, and spent some time in his unit very early on, about 30 years back. Now Keyes Hubriski uh, taught me something very important. He was this uh, very large, obese man with a big belly. He would put the endoscope on his belly and no movement at all. And he would always go into the papilla, right direction always, no movement at all. <laughs> He showed me actually the economy of movement is so important in endoscopy and when actually I look at various endoscopies doing endoscopy now, the good ones and bad ones can be picked very easily. The one who is moving endoscope too much is not a good endoscopist. The one who is not moving is a good endoscopist and Keith was a classic example of that. They, some of his uh, assistants would spend hours together trying to get into the papilla to the common bile duct and finally they will call him. He will just come, rest it on his belly and just go in immediately in a few seconds time. He was a fantastic ERC piston. Uh, my icon, my guru was always Peter Cotton. Peter Cotton, uh, I think, was actually, we sometimes call him the god of ERCP. He had uh, a certain style, he was of course also extremely academic. He had several, you can see several classifications named after him and so on. A very typical British reserve type. If you don't know him, you'd think he's arrogant, but he was not. He was, again, extremely fond of transmitting his knowledges. And, Peter, of course, I came to know him quite well later and I was actually thrilled when his book came out. He, uh, the book is called The Tunnel End of the Light. He wrote uh, this book after he retired, showing his career, and he mentions that uh, I was his grandson, endoscopic grandson. The reason is Jung Dilawari, who was my boss, actually worked with him and then, of course, I came to know Peter very well and he had this picture of me and James in his book, uh, which for me was an extremely proud moment to call to be called by a mentor as a grandson, I think, was for me the ultimate achievement in the field of endoscopy. Uh, in early endoscopy, it was not so easy. Uh, when the, in the late 90s and early 20s, when video endoscopes came, again, this is a picture. Uh, actually, I had a lot of hair. Unfortunately, the photographer cut off that part. Uh, believe me, I had a lot of thick hair at that time. Anyway, so I was. Uh, so the video endoscopes came in at that time, and of course, we had uh, uh, certain difficulties. Uh, and this is the first ERCP that one of the early ERCPs that I did, which I still remember. I thought I should show this to you. This was a patient who came with a large CBD stone. The stone was stuck in the lower end of the CBD. I put a basket inside and I couldn't get the stone out. The stone was stuck, the basket was stuck, and the endoscope was stuck, and I was stuck. <laughs> The, at that point of time, we didn't have mechanical lithotriptors, we didn't know how to cut the basket and so on, and um, the patient ultimately had to go to the surgeon. We had a surgeon, this was the Nizam's Institute, we had a surgeon who was fairly aggressive who had uh, contempt for endoscopies and he was waiting for a mistake to occur. And when this mistake occurred, I actually, we had to wheel the patient myself in the endoscopy room. He took a picture of the patient, a very nice picture, he was a good photographer also, a very nice picture of the endoscope with the patient stuck with it. 
and um, uh, fortunately at that time there's no social media and there's no <laughs> Facebook so he didn't get virally circulated but he kept it within himself and um, and whenever he used to call, cross me, of course he successfully removed the endoscope, basket, everything from the patient. And whenever he would meet me on the corridor, every time he would give this one of his smirking smiles, you know, so that remind me that uh, surgery is still superior. At that point of time, for the next six months, I stopped doing endoscopy and uh, trying to see what could be done. In fact, I went back to Nip Sohendra to ask him and he told me he had exactly similar uh, problem. But Nip was very innovative. What he did was he took uh, a mechanical... Uh, lithotripsy. This is not a true mechanism. This was Atkinson's uh, stent. I don't know, again, the older people remember the Atkinson's stent. I think Jayanti is also a Palani and Jayanti. Remember, they used to have this Atkinson stent. We used to put for esophageal CS. So he took that, made it, put it through a basket and crushed the stone. So later he, he invented this mechanical lithotripsy. So it took us six months to get the mechanical lithotripsy at that time. Uh, to convince the administrators that we can't do ERCP without mechanical lithotripsy. And only after we got it, we did, went on to do for the ERCPs. Of course, we now have this mechanical lithotriptors, we have uh, balloons, and of course, we have um, of course, extracorporeal shockwave, and you have seen this morning spicolangoscopy, so many other gadgets, so that removing even very difficult CBD stones has become extremely easy, and we don't have to go through the earlier challenges that we went through before. Um, another hero of mine is Michel Kramer. Michel Kramer visited us in 1997 uh, at a, a workshop in Hyderabad. Uh, he was also another giant in endoscopy and he was a pioneer in pancreatic endotherapy. And with his visit, uh, our unit got very interested in pancreatic endotherapy. Uh, this was a very historical slide that he gave me. The first patient of pancreatic stone removal by endoscopic therapy, 40 years later, is still coming to his unit. Um, using extracorporeal shock lithotripsy, uh, pancreatic calicle can, can be removed very easily and again, now in our unit, we have probably the world's largest experience of using this uh, technique to clear pancreatic duct of pancreatic stones. Again, this is a field that we have been very interested long on. Again, just because of visit of Michel Kramer, this inspired us to go into this area. Of course, with ERCP now, it's become much easier. You have newer axeries, you have uh, this extremely slippery guide wires, you have intelligent cautery. So, for the younger generation, sometimes they don't realize uh, uh, how difficult it was in the earlier days. I think there are many seniors here, Pramod also is here. We realized that uh, we used to have this very uh, fiber optic scopes with a very narrow view of 100 degrees. It was a big, actually it was a celebration when you found the papilla and imagine cannulating the papilla. So this used to be that. So now it's become so easy that sometimes you wonder why they were struggling. And one of the things we didn't realize uh, was the complications that we could produce. Uh, in ERCP, if you cannulate the pancreatic duct, the success of ERCP at that time was defined as cannulation of the papilla. The second success was selective cannulation of the papilla. The definition has changed totally now. The success of ERCP is lack of complications. You succeed when you don't produce or produce very low complication. And this change occurs mainly because of this paper by Marty Freeman in New England Journal, where for the first time he systematically collected the complications that can occur with ERCP and published. And this became a landmark paper, of course. And we now very carefully define which patients are likely to develop. We know which, which uh, uh, type of disease is likely to develop complications and so on. And you can very easily now actually eliminate or just get down a complication rate from 10% to 2%. But in the early days, this wasn't so. And this was one of my worst complications. And this, when I look back at this ERCP film, I now know why I produced this complication. This was an young patient uh, with recurrent pancreatitis. First of all, there's no strong indication for ERCP in this case. We did an ERCP and you can see what I did. At that time, he was a very obese patient. Fluoroscopy was not very good, not able to see. I overfilled the pancreatic duct. You can see SNR filling there, totally filled up. He developed severe post-ERCP pancreatitis, had pancreatic abscess, uh, went around. Actually, he was fairly well connected, went around the whole country to different doctors, did a lot of disreputation for me. But I think that I learned my lesson that I think it's very important that the, the most important thing in therapeutic endoscopy is not your success rates, but your ability to decrease the complication rates. We now, of course, have a variety of techniques. We have this uh, pancreatic stents, endomethacin, uh, we have uh, um, IV fluids and so on, with which we decrease our, our pancreatic rate in our institute, all this done by a large number of people, is coming down to about 2%. 
post trc pancreatitis i think this is because of all these techniques but i think when complications come i realize also more so in endoscopy than any other field it is our ability to how we deal with this complication in fact uh, this is atul gawande's very famous book and let me read this with you he said that in medicine we look as an orderly field of knowledge and procedure but it's not it's an imperfect science an enterprise of constantly changing knowledge uncertain information fallible individuals at same time lives on line there is science in what we do yes but also habit intuition and sometimes plain old guessing the gap between what we know and what we aim for persists and this complicates everything we do uh, very very few lay people realize this gaps in science that are there and this is more so for endoscopy Uh, i think it's very important that uh, when we proceed on to new procedures that we think of this because uh, how should we sort of decrease our complication data and i think a follow up of this book was a checklist by atul gawande based on the checklist that the airlines follow and he showed very clearly that on following certain protocols you can actually decrease and that is what we do for example for a poem now we have a checklist where there is a checklist nurse specifically for this she checks the equipment she checks the cautery she checks if coagulation forceps is working she checks if the carbon dioxide is flowing and not air because you can actually kill a patient with air in poem all these things checklist are and then what we have found is that again using a checklist nurse for endoscopy procedures you can actually decrease the complication there and i would strongly advise for those who are doing therapeutic endoscopy here that they should have their checklist nurses both for uh, advanced procedures and even ERCPs and so on so that you can minimize your complication rate once you do that another thing i learned uh, again with uh, experience and collaboration with other people is this if you have a complication what to do this is michael burke one of the best endoscopists in the world and see what he does he's doing a ampullectomy in one of our courses in hyderabad transmitted to london world congress he removes the ampulla standard procedure removes the ampulla and you can see what happens we knew in the anatomy textbook of gray that the two large arterioles in the bottom of the papilla first time we see it here and you can see there was so much of bleed here but look at his face nothing happens he doesn't change his thinking what to do he is very calm he is communicating with his assistants what axillaries he requires next he has his axillaries ready of the he knows that the vessel near on the left side is near the pancreatic duct so he clips it doesn't use the thermal energy on the right side near the bile duct he uses thermal energy stops the bleed so there are several lessons in this that you have to stay very calm take a deep breath decide what to do you have to have your axillary ready and you have to communicate with your assistant well so in a complication during endoscopy you require all these skills and this is what uh, this clearly shows i think this is an important lesson for us doing endoscopy um uh, another thing that changed during my course in ERCP is this that uh, diagnostic ERCP we stopped doing it as fast in fact in 1992 when ERCP was its peak and Peter Cotton was the king of ERCP his car number was ERCP1 this is a plate he named it as ERCP1 in 2003 his car broke he had a big accident car broke and incidentally that was the year that diagnostic ERCP completely went off there's no diagnostic ERCP at all very symbolic he gave me these slides that uh, we no longer do diagnostic ERCP anymore because of of course uh, secreting mrp in fact the uh, the person who actually was responsible for secreting mrp is milos uh, he is he was in brazil earlier now in portugal and recently i had uh, occasion to spend an evening with him and asked him how come you got the secret mrcp so prominent and the reason he had was that one of his very close relatives actually had a diagnostic ercp and died because of this so he started thinking can we make it safer why do diagnostic ercp at all and then he came up with mrcp and secret mrcp which now has become the gold standard for a diagnostic pancreatic biliary imaging rather than ercp and the other thing with uh, which came along was of course endoscopic ultrasound again you have seen lot of it we have many pioneers here uh, we have manuel we have anthony uh, diagnostic uh, us now has completely overtaken diagnostic ercp and to some extent diagnostic therapeutic us also is taking over in many areas as you have seen today and one of the regrets that i have in my life is that i actually didn't go into this field because uh, some of my younger colleagues sandeep and mohan are in it already but pancreatic biliary endoscopy now i think is not only ercp but us in 1992 or 90 yeah, 1992 actually i was trained in us but unfortunately at that time the endoscopic ultrasound machine was terrible it used to be a very heavy machine very difficult to hold for long the images were very bad i went to nip sohendra's unit to train and they had this very dark room very difficult machine very gray images and the doctor who was doing it who was trying to teach me was his name is dr grim so, so it was 
the peculiar combination of Dr. Grimm, gray images, gray scale, everything. So that discouraged me from going very deep into endoscopic ultrasound. Although I did endoscopy for some time. And uh, these are two of my heroes, Jack David and Rob Hoss, who actually are very successful in combining endoscopic ultrasound with ERCP and showing that it actually is a field that I think for any younger endoscopies going into pancreatic or biliary endoscopy should now actually do endoscopic ultrasound along with ERCP and not separately. So in uh, up to late 1990s or early 2000, I was very busy with clinical practice. Like Ashok said, I uh, we are seeing a lot of patients doing a lot of procedures. And um, uh, that point of time, I really thought, is it really worthwhile going into academic and doing research? Uh, but I think something happened at that time which changed me. In fact, uh, on one of those occasions, my dad, who was a pathologist, I think, Anna knows him very well. He called me up one day and actually gave me a dressing down that you are, you are wasting your life completely. What have you done? You have done some procedures. You have done maybe made a little money and uh, you think you have achieved your, you are a zero in, in medicine as far as considered. You haven't, you didn't publish anything. You haven't organized your uh, work. Nothing is absolutely. And then I, that made me think that maybe, maybe I was in the wrong track, that I should change my track now. And that's when I started thinking that I think uh, most of us, when we get busy with procedures, we're busy clinicians, we tend to think less about other things. The long-term perspective doesn't come in at all. I think sometimes it's important to stop, change, track, think, but maybe we are not in the right pathway, and that's how I changed. There were certain difficulties in doing research in endoscopy at that time, as most of our heroes for themselves, we were not doing so much. Most of endoscopy was uh, you know, incidental findings, there no proper science in endoscopy. In fact, this was a NIH uh, uh, review conference. NIH very rarely looks at endoscopy because they're not considered intellectuals. Their conferences are usually on hepatology, hepatitis virus, and so on. This was the first occasion they called endoscopies together to look at the literature of endoscopy in the world to see is it evidence-based. And look at this, 22 years of ERCP, they looked at so many citations. And finally, they found that only 149 articles in 20 years were suitable for review in a good journal. So this was uh, the science of endoscopy at that point of time. So they, uh, and many of the pioneers, you see here all the pioneers in 1970, they were all extremely good technically innovators, but unfortunately, science of endoscopy at that time was not very strongly propagated, and many of us were following this suit. If you look at endoscopic literature, this is very, very interesting. In 1970, there were only case reports. Some of these pioneers were desc describing what happened. In 1980s came observation studies. In 1990, the first RCT was published. Compare this with the first RCT in gastroenterology, 1955, True Love and Sydney True Love on ulcerative colitis. The first RCT was almost 35 years later in endoscopy, gallstone pancreatitis by uh, the group from Leeds. And then, of course, came meta-analysis and, of course, systematic reviews. And what you'll see here is that most of the innovations in endoscopy occurred in, during the early period when there's not much of a literature. Later on, innovations came down and uh, endoscopy became true science. Now there's a little increase now which is occurring, and I'll tell you why this increase is there occurring. So this is how, if you look at the literature, endoscopy followed. And one of the reasons, in fact, I was discussing this promote earlier, one of the reasons in India we're not doing so much in terms of big international publications is that because they're not collaborating. All the big endoscopic uh, papers now are collaborative papers. You cannot be producing big papers just sitting in an endoscopic unit, collecting your data and producing so on. Even if it's a good RCT, it doesn't come out. And like Anna said earlier, it's going to be multidisciplinary also. It has to be a collaborative. And this is what we learned in our recent years, that if you have a multi-central collaboration, you can start producing better papers, better quality research. And this is what we did. We got into collaboration with many universities in our institute. And of course, came out papers like this. For example, this was a paper which was many centers collaborating together. You can see Sandeep also on it. And um, there's going to be a follow-up paper. We're hoping New England Journal on long-term follow-up of this, where uh, we demonstrated that for benign strictures, you can actually put completely covered stent very safely, changing clinical practice. So I think this is uh, very important. This is a lesson that we learned that 
and i think the lesson that in india we should learn i think we should as indian centers come together do multi centric studies and i'm sure our publication rates will go up and not be in the pathetic situation we are now because over a period of time using all this we increased our publications and i think what we realized is that we started getting a joy of seeing a paper in publication as much as a joy of getting a cbd stone out of uh, uh, the bile duct i think this was becoming equal now whereas earlier it used to be different i think this is uh, something that we have learned over years uh there's been a slight change of how science and research are done now the old method the traditional method i think when rama and all were doing was that you formulate a hypothesis accumulate data and do extensive experimentation this is how now it's different now the new method is formulate a hypothesis patent it and raise a couple of millions and then uh, go about it this is how it's happening and this is an experience that in fact i've had uh, some now uh, this patent system can be sometimes quite killing and this is a personal experience i realized and i i thought i'll show you take you to the journey this this is the stent uh, which maybe 15 years back i actually made because at that time we were draining this uh, pseudocyst and wands through the ercp scope we didn't have a proper stent so i thought why not uh, devise a stent and immediately tevum company came up with this stent uh, and made this stent there nothing no discussions nothing on what to do just the diagram of the stent they made the stent we started using it we were quite successful uh, unfortunately this stent is named after me i don't get any royalty or anything from this uh, the reason unfortunately because people think i became rich because of this stent which was not true uh, at that time we didn't realize that you had to sign mous you had to do all these things and all that and this stent was uh, now the actually the largest used stent in uh, uh, in draining pancreatic fluid and then came the axial stent and again anthony is an expert in this area and just with hot axial stent which is now i think they have demonstrated this uh, in this workshop okay so this hot axial stent what they did with hot axial stent is they patented everything including including the cautery part including the stent design everything together so when we went back to see if we can change our stent into a better stent it's impossible to do it because everything is patented now this patency kills innovation in medicine and unfortunately we have to live with it so what we think is that we should move from this so in a new place we are in fact we are starting a center for innovation and engineering where doctors and engineering can come together we have excellent uh, engineers in iits indian institute of science and so on if we as doctors can collaborate with them we can actually uh, do devices and then do all this stuff instead of companies and other making profits out of us and i think time has come now for endoscopic units to partner with engineering units and set up these uh, units in our own so those who are building new endoscopy unit i know cmc velur is building one now in the new building i would suggest to give a small workshop for uh, engineering colleagues to come in and have this workshop for innovations to come uh, one of the um, follow up of this has been the new sleeve that we are doing now for diabetes mellitus i'll come to it little later we're putting this sleeve we can actually sometimes treat this very difficult type 2 diabetes so i think these are uh, examples and uh, another important thing that i realized in a journey in the endoscopy world is that endoscopy is not isolated by itself endoscopy has to be um, coming together with certain basic sciences which are doing there is a dramatic progress in many basic sciences so we started this institute of basic sciences which is a part of our hospital now and uh, you can see that prof sanil rastogi is from university of pennsylvania he is now actually our um, sort of mentor and uh, director for this we have had um, um, some excellent research going on in this area and this is one example uh, this is the ips technology yamanaka got the nobel prize for this you can see with ips technology you can actually transform a fibroblast into any cell you want and here in our basic science lab they are transforming a fibroblast into low resistance splinter cell so technically for example for a patient you have with a gerd who is resistant to all forms of therapy instead of doing surgery and so on you can take a skin biopsy create billions of these low resistance splinter vessels and create new splinter in the patient as an endoscopist we now have the ability to go into every part of the gi tract and our basic scientists can make any cell in the body from a fibroblast using ips technology so you can imagine the fantastic future we have if you can combine these two technologies and i think this is how is endoscopy is going to move with basic sciences uh, we also with brainstorming with iits and iscs we have now a lot of grants coming from dbt there is a grant called the imprint grant which we have, we have just received and we could actually make an endoscopic simulator with this which is an advanced stage uh, endoscopic simulator currently cost almost $70000 and very difficult for medical colleges to afford this this is an endoscopic simulator we can make for about $3000 so you can imagine 
the cost that can come down with it. I think this has become very important in teaching. Um, I think training is an area that I've observed over the last 30 years that I think we have uh, been uh, uh, sort of deficient on in our Indian society. I think we are starting to, to some extent, is starting to get corrected with workshops like this, with uh, you know small training centers now where you have uh, training, uh, um, hands-on small training experience. All these are going to come, and I'm glad that we in India are able to get into this. But I think. It's also important to have these large shows. People have criticized these large shows. They say, you people, endoscopists are showmen. You just want to put these large shows, people sitting and watching. What can they do? What can they learn? But it's wrong. I think it is important because this is what inspires people to get into this. These Hong Kong workshops of 1985 inspired many of us to go into the field of endoscopy. And I think these workshops, I'm sure this two-day workshop is going to inspire at least some of the youngsters here to go into endoscopy as a career. Um, we are glad that last year we were able to do this World uh, Congress of G and the first World Congress. In fact, there was a lot of fights and debates to get it to India, but finally we did. Over oh, 5,000 attendees from all over the world actually at least came to know where Hyderabad in India was. The consequence of this, of course, has been that we have been um, having many of these. I don't want to showcase this too much, but there are some lessons I learned during my journey that I'd like to uh, tell you. The first lesson is that there's a wrong notion many people have that you are born with a good hand-side coordination, that surgeons are born surgeons and so on. This is absolutely wrong. I think excellence is not a knack but a habit. You become good by repeatedly doing a procedure. In fact, there is this uh, outlier, Malcolm Gadmill, very clearly puts it that to become an expert, you have to do something 10,000 times. So you do hundreds and hundreds of endoscopy, you become an expert in endoscopy. You, do, you are not born an endoscopist. Uh, there used to be a very famous surgeon in, 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 in Andhra Pradesh, name was S.S. Reddy. Everybody used to call him a born genius, you know, surgeon. He, as if when he was born itself, he knew how to tie knots. Uh, so I used to also think that maybe he had some special name. And then I went, I went to his home one day, I found out, he was actually sitting on a bed, on a bed sheet, tying knots on the bed sheet. So this expert surgeon was actually practicing knots in his house. And repeatedly doing this, he became an expert at that. So I think this is very important to know that expertise. Uh, the second lesson I learned is that in endoscopy, just because you can do something does not mean you should do it. Just because you can pass a guide wire across the papilla does not mean you should cut the papilla. Uh, I had also a bitter experience in one of the workshops in, in an Arabic country. I was doing a workshop and they had put up a case for ampullectomy. There were about 1,000 people in the audience because they never seen an ampullectomy before. And uh, this director of the workshop was moderating this session and uh, I went in, went and saw the papilla looked normal, totally normal. So I told him the papilla is normal, uh, but he said, look, there are 1,000 people waiting to watch, kindly do an ampullectomy. <laughs> I said, maybe 1,000 people, but I can't do an ampullectomy because ampullectomy is a very dangerous procedure. So it took me some diplomacy to get out of the procedure. So I think this is, in a, the third lesson is this, that this is actually Michelangelo who at 88 years, just finishing his last sculpture, has this, I'm still learning. I think this is the humility is very important to have as endoscopists for us, that we keep so many advanced suckering that we should keep learning. And this is a very important lesson. I learned also from Michel Kramer. When Michel Kramer died, um, I spent the la his last few days, I went to his village to spend with him and um, had some conversations. He allowed me to look at his old records. This is the first ERCP case in the world that were done. And he writes it down in a chart. And this is in French. So what he writes is the first few cases, see, he failed. And one of the patients died, but he writes it down very honestly. The importance of this was persistence. When you're doing something, you have to be persistent, but you also have to be honest about it, to review it, to see if you have to stop at some stage. This is an important. The other important lesson I learned is from this. Uh, very early on when I was doing ERCP, I saw, uh, you can see Ascaris is scannulating the papilla. It doesn't, that just doesn't go inside. It goes very slowly, palpates the papilla, looks around, and then goes into CPD. The reason is if the ascariasis goes by mistake into the pancreatic duct, it dies. So it has to have a 100% accuracy of cannulation rates. <laughs> Unfortunately, for endoscopists, if endoscopist goes into the wrong track, the patient dies, not the endoscopist. So it doesn't care so much. But I think you have to be careful about this. Uh, in 1970s, when I was doing MBBS, uh, the relationship between gastroenterologist and surgeons was very, very difficult. The gastroenterologist thought surgeons were very aggressive, ablative, risky. The surgeons thought gastroenterologists were contemplative, diagnostic, and important. That was, but this has changed. I think it's very important that we should now maintain 
be extremely friendly. If you have to be a good therapeutic endoscopist, you have to have a good surgical friend, at least one good surgical friend. Remember that. <laughs> because if you get in trouble, he's the one who's going to save you from that. And lastly, a little about what's going to happen in GI endoscopy is what I was asked to also comment on. Uh, this is something which is extremely embarrassing to endoscopy that over the last 50 years, the endoscopy design has not changed. There's no other instrument in medicine which has not changed in 50 years except the scalpel. And uh, I think this is another well, not change at all. This is, but I think they will change. And one of the reasons they change is because of this infection complication, a lot of news coming in papers about this. And what is going to happen is that we are soon going to get these disposable endoscopes. They are coming in. Over the next five years, our endoscopies are going to be done. They are going to become cheap. Currently, this is a disposable colonoscope made by Invento company in Germany. They are selling it commercially. It's 300 euro. But when they do mass production, it will come down to 100 euro. And then what's going to happen is going to be more and more disposable. Industry is going to change completely. The other thing that's going to happen is you're going to get robotic surgery. Surgeons already have this and we are now, in fact, this is the first world flexible robotic surgery done in our institute. This was published uh, some time back where we can attach small robotic arms to the endoscope and you can do very difficult decisions, uh, dissections like this also. And AI, artificial intelligence is going to come in also. This is uh, Professor Kudo. He has this scope now, which is uh, endobrain it's called. He sees a polyp there. All he does is he puts the scope at the polyp and immediately you get a lesion. Neoplastic with 87%. Uh, so these are going to come soon so that you don't, uh, again, we go back to being carpenters rather than intellectuals. You don't have to think too much to get the diagnosis. Uh, also, we're going to go more into metabolic, uh, I think, endoscopy. And this is a procedure that is getting popularity now, where you can do a resurfacing of the dural mucosa and very difficult type 2 diabetics can now be treated because we now know that the control of the whole metabolic process of the, uh, of the body is not in the pancreas but in the duodenum and that's where all the hormonal changes. By resurfacing the mucosa endoscopically, you can actually reset the barometer and this is very exciting that the most important field in future is going to be for endoscopies, metabolic endoscopy. And you can see the glycemic improvement that can come with this. Several years back, uh, the North natural orifice transfemoral endoscopic surgery came in and this was year 2000 when Johns Hopkins showed the first animal work. And uh, in, what, two years later, uh, me along with my colleague Dr. G. V. Rao, we did the first transgastric appendectomy. This was a patient with extensive burns where going through the stomach, making an opening, went, went up to the appendix and the appendix was then removed through the, through the mouth. Uh, it was quite surprising at that point of stage because when it came out, all of our staff were quite surprised. We had to surprise because it was the first case. And uh, since then, notes went into disrepute because there's no instrumentation and not enough this thing. But of course, it has come back now. It was a very disruptive technology, breaking the barriers between surgeons and physicians. But it's now come back with uh, procedures like paroral endoscopic myotomy, procedures like... Uh, um, full thickness resections and so on. All notes procedures are now come back. And I think this has given us opportunity, especially in India, to start working on these areas and publishing because I think our country is the one which is doing largest number of these procedures and you can see a variety of these procedures. My colleagues uh, Mohan and Zaheer have been able to produce. In fact, uh, we have the largest number of procedure, um, papers and poem from a single institution. Uh, and lastly, there's one area that we as endoscopists or we, those of us practicing in major tertiary institutions neglect, and that is uh, patients who are, can't come to us, those who are staying in rural areas, villages. 70% of our patients stay there. Some time back we had this idea whether we can reach them out uh, through, not through our institution, but through other areas. And fortunately, with help from ISRO, we could get this communication uh, vans which have satellites on the top. We can actually have... This can go into the villages, you can set up camps, do endoscopy in this, in this vans, ultrasound, everything, and this can be transmitted uh, to the endoscopy center itself so that you can look out a large number of rural population uh, without they having to come to our centers. I think this is another important thing that we ignore as endoscopies. Our program got disrupted when there's a big agitation in Andhra for a separate Telangana, but we are planning to start this soon. I think this is an area that we should look into because this uh, can help us reach a larger section of population. And finally, uh, some years back, uh, as we were progressing, the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh called me once and told me, uh, okay, you seem to be doing well. Do you think you can build the best hospital in the world? I said, no, I don't think we can build the best hospital in the world. But at least I can do is build one of the best endoscopy units in the world. So he gave me this uh, seven acres of land and said, okay, let's see if you can do it. Um, so this started, as you can see, in March. 2015, it went on. Over a period of time, you can see how the buildings got transformed now. 
So this is, uh, we have had a lot of help from donors and from uh, many people in society. And as the hospital came up, you can see the surrounding area is also transforming. The whole landscape got transformed. We have two, one, one clinical section with nearly a thousand beds and the second one is a research section. I think this is very important. The second research building is just close to the main clinical building so we can collaborate. And what we built in this hospital is probably the finest endoscopy suites in the world. So this is a promise that I kept to him. It uh, now is turned out with transmission center so that we can transmit the state of art to any part of the world. Um, in my journey, I've been very fortunate uh, to have participated in over 200 international workshops all over the world. Uh, in many of these workshops, uh, you interact with a lot of international faculty, you learn with every workshop. And one of the things I found, which I realized is very important, again, as a message for us, for Indians, is that to be excellent, you have to sub-specialize. You see the Japanese endoscopies. There's somebody who's doing uh, only uh, ESTs, somebody doing only poems, somebody doing only ERCP, they don't mix up. Of course, unfortunately, at this situation in our country, we still have a lot of mixture going on. But ultimately, if we want to sub-specialize, you have to, you have to sub-specialize. If you want to be the world leaders, you have to sub-specialize. And this is what we should do for the anger gas endoscopy. They should come together, sub-specialize in groups in each area, concentrate on one area, and they become the world leaders. In fact, uh, what I've also found is that when we compare our endoscopy skills with the rest of the world, I mean, with apologies to Anthony and uh, Manuel, I think Indians are the best in endoscopy. The reason, <laughs> the reason they are best is they eat with their hands. When you eat with your hand, you become very flexible. The Chinese are second best because they're eating with chopsticks. They're second best. The Westerners are eating with knives and forks, you know. Yes. So that's the reason why uh, we are the best. But unfortunately, we are very disorganized. We are not organized enough. We have to get organized to become the world leaders. Of course, I also realize in several parts of the world, they have different practices. In China, for example, in many parts of China, when I go for, they give me a lead gown, and they also give a lead cap to protect your brain from radiation. I tell them it's already too late for me. <laughs> so they're, they're different practices, but you learn a lot when you go to this. And I ultimately, it culminated in, for me, big pride was to become the president of the World Gastroenterology. It was surprising that an Indian had an in, uh, institution with, you have uh, American, ga Japanese, and European gastroenterologists as under the wing of the World Endoscopy Organization. This is not to just show that I became, but just show that uh, for Indians also it, c it can be a possibility to get to the top, that we are, we are actually extremely good in this area. It's just that we have to get better organized uh, to show the rest of the world that we can do things which are as good. And finally, um, I think this is something that I'd like to show. This is actually a very famous painting called The Doctor. So Luke Fields' uh, child died of diarrhea. And a country doctor in, in UK is to come and look after him. Uh, in spite of the fact the child died, Luke Fields was so impressed with how this doctor was seeing this child that he painted this for him. You can see what this doctor had was, uh, he didn't have endoscopes, ultrasounds, magic bullets, antibiotics and so on. This was in 1857, 1887. But he had extreme empathy for this patient. And this extreme empathy is transmitted to the parent, to the parents also. Empathy is not sympathy for the patient. Empathy is putting yourself in the shoes of the patient and the relatives to see how they feel so that you feel the same way. And as endoscopists, what we often lack is, is that we become dehumanized. It's a walled off necrosis to be drained. It's a CBD stone to be removed. We don't even look sometimes at the patient also. We're just looking, we get dehumanized. And this dehumanization, I think the worst thing that can happen to an endoscopist. Endoscopy to me is not only an art. Endoscopy is an art, it's science and it's empathy. These three things together constantly. That's what I've learned in this long career that as you become more and more mature, you empathize with the patient. Maybe as you more and more empathize with the patient, you become less aggressive endoscopist. But for the patient, this is more important, that you have to have a feeling for the patient. And on all this journey, there's something that I can tell you is that uh, the most important thing, of, uh, thing about endoscopy, when people ask me how did you achieve all that, I'd say that the answer is the team. The most important thing nowadays in endoscopy is the team. We have our team here. Of course, two of them are here, Mohan and Sandeep. We have a, an extraordinary team doing excellent work with passion and commitment. They do all the work and I take all the credit. In fact, I shine in their shadows. I think this is extremely important. And as I end, I'd like to say this, what Robert Foss said, that uh, 
for those who have taken up endoscopy early and those who are still taking some of these new procedures, I shall tell this with a size some way, ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood. I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'd like to request Dr. J.V. Peter to present Dr. Nageshwar Reddy with a memento and Dr. Anna Pulimund to uh, give him the centenary souvenir and certificate. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll end today with our last session of the evening. Uh, I'd like to call upon the following chair people. Dr. K.R. Palani Swami, Senior Consultant, Gastroenterology, Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Dr. Jayanti V., Senior Consultant, Gastroenterology, Glen Eagles Global Health City, Chennai. Dr. George Chandi, Director and CEO, Believers Church Medical College Hospital, Thiruvala, Kerala. And Dr. George Kurian, Professor and Head of Department, Department of Gastroenterology, Pims Pondicherry. Uh, we shall start with the uh, last session. I shall invite uh, Dr. Uh, Professor V. S. Ramakrishna to talk on research opportunities in uh, GI endoscopy. Sorry, we come to this last session and, you know, to talk about research in endoscopy after Nagi, <laughs> after he's floored us with all those wonderful pictures and pictorial representation and his vision of the future, I think it's, it's redundant. But I, I'm, so let me just go through some of these things which I think to my, uh, junior colleagues in Velour that I, I, I think that they need to establish something in terms of research and endoscopy. So when you talk about research, I mean, we, we've covered all, I think Dagi has covered all these with, with flair that I can definitely not match. So it's why, what, where, and how. Why, I mean, people have all kinds of reasons. Some people say to improve patient care, to make available newer therapies, you know, for people who cannot afford them. If you're commercial, you'll say, hey, it might give me, bring me more patients. But I think what motivates people like Nagi and a lot of other people is actually for research, is actually for fun and self-fulfillment. And so you see that cartoon there, this guy was rubbing sticks and made a fire and he said, I didn't know I was doing basic research. So the problem is that when we do research or when we, do, when we develop something, one of the things is, and again, Nagi showed this very nicely, that you have to document what you're doing and you have to document it honestly. I mean, you, you shouldn't fudge. <laughs> I think you, that, that a very uh, nice piece there. So what kind of research? I think technological research is large, largely the realm of biomedical engineers. It can be innovative, it can be incremental. And just to look at what is incremental, so people look at it very analytically. So people who are into engineering will say, hey, what can I do with capsule endoscopy? Why can I not do more things? 
Why is the design of the endoscope not changed? And that's because there's no self-locomotion. So what people are trying to look is to see if they can actually improve locomotion, which will keep your direction straight. It'll, it'll make it faster so that, you know, you don't have to do eight hours of small bowel endoscopy. So that's, that's where people are looking. And there are white papers which academics and industry together have come to write, which is, you know, how, how, how you go about doing this. So this is basically in terms of te technological innovation. Now techniques, again and again, uh, Nagi is, 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 is a master at these. Uh, so develop, design and development of endoscopic techniques, it's, it, it's happened. A lot of it is incremental, I understand. But obviously there's some, something very innovative there as well. We've seen excellent representations of it today from uh, the workshop that we've had. And the, what I really would emphasize to the younger endoscopists here is to really document what they are doing. There's outcomes research, and outcomes research is something that, you know, people might want to know. Again, you know, is POEM going to help? Uh, that's over a long period of time. Does it improve quality of life? How long does it improve quality of life? So there's uh, people who talk about the differentiation between outcomes research and traditional clinical research, but outcomes is where most people are looking at for guidelines nowadays. And then there's operations research, which is mainly for managers. You know, how do I manage room flow in, an in a busy endoscopy suite? Uh, what are novel sedation delivery methods and so on? And again, so there's, these are all examples of research that can be done. The, but if you, when you go and look at what kind of research, so if you go to some of the websites, university websites, you see that these are the kinds of research people are doing. Uh, they, this is too small, I'm not going to bother you with that. But when you think about where can you do the research, or where can you learn how to do research in endoscopy, there are very few structured programs which offer opportunities for learning or doing endoscopic research. Nagi, I hope you're going to establish one of these. Uh, so when you go look at the University of Florida Health site and put in endoscopy research studies, it says none. Uh, the one program that does offer uh, opportunities in endoscopy research is, uh, is in the University of the Virginia Mason University in Seattle and Richard Kozarek has been instrumental in this. He's the president of the WEO nowadays. And uh, so this fellowship at Virginia Mason gives you a one-year fellowship in, in, focusing on academic output and publication. It's available to people, anybody with a basic medical degree and three years of experience in gastroenterology and see what their manifest is, which is basically to say that they will help construct, maintain, and use robust databases for study of endoscopic topics, to apply outcomes data, to provide a foundation for improving quality of care, focus on retrospective and prospective chart review studies to complement ongoing clinical research. So to all of you, again, this is a point that Nagi made. So first thing, so when you sit about. I think CMC has a great opportunity. We have young, uh, energetic endoscopists here, and we have a huge patient population. And we have all the collaborators around us that we can desire. Uh, so first you identify your collaborators. Are they from industry? Are they academics? Are they biostatistics? Whoever it is, collect all of them. Next, secure funding. So when we look at funding, I think most people see endoscopy as a money generating venture. So what I would really suggest is that a proportion of that money be invested in research. So the founders of CMC or the very earlier people of C, uh, early people of CMC had a vision. So they said 1% of the whatever the profits of the institution will go into a fund that funds research. I think that was very progressive, and that was in many years ago. And whatever you do, I think you should do this. I think George has, uh, when he was director, and there's so many examples, uh, people have tried to do this. And certainly that's something that should be done. So that's intramural funding. Now, industry funding is available sometimes. Uh, for instance, uh, the SAGES program uh, is funded significantly by Ethicon. The Japan, uh, Japanese Foundation for Research and Promotion of Endoscopy is funded almost exclusively by Olympus, uh, and so on. 
And then there are national organizations which might fund this. For instance, this, the NIH funds this initiative uh, not very far from Seattle. This is in Portland, Oregon. So the third thing, I think, in terms of study design, when you do this, is, is, is to have workshops, have a consultation. And, and this is something that we are all familiar with. We have very good uh, epidemiology and biostatistics units here that will take us through this. The other problem that I face uh, with, is with ethics committees. And as you know, when you try anything new, I mean, when you did your, uh, lapar with your gastroscopic appendectomy, there was criticism, right? And so that is because people don't understand what you're doing. And I think one of the basic processes that we have to do as physicians when we sit in ethics committees is to sensitize the non-physician members and tell them why we're doing this and what are the pro prospects. Because very often I see the lawyer in our ethics committee will raise objections. And that's something that I think that we need. A sensitization is something which is extremely important. So also, all of you need to become familiarized with the process of submission to ethics committee. Like anything else, it's an art. You learn how to do it so that you're successful in, your, in getting your submission through the IEC. Informed consent is something which is very important. So there's translation, there's back translation. People need to get familiar with this. Data collection forms are extremely important. And, and here it's not only translation and back translation, you need validation. Uh, recently, I had to get uh, one of the University of Oxford uh, this is the musculoskeletal health questionnaire. And I wanted their permission to use it. So they, when I, they asked me what trans, like, languages do I want. I said, I want Tamil, Oriya, and Hindi. And uh, so their uh, answer was, okay, this is what you've got to do. So th there's a seven-step process that you've got to go through to get it validated. And finally, research personnel. So essentially, I think you need a trained cadre of research assistants, uh, since endoscopy generates money, it should not be difficult to employ somebody who will eventually, I mean, in their own way, they can go on to get a PhD in something and, and, and get them to help you with your research. Maintain, people need to know how to maintain anonymized databases and they need to know how to maintain this over long periods of time. Patient follow-up is extremely important, so you need patient care coordinators for that. And then, of course, finally, there's the role of CROs, which currently is not major, but it's going to come up in a main way. So finally, to all my friends here, just to quote Lao Tzu, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So I'll urge you to take that single step. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rama, for an excellent lecture. I think probably you will expect questions from a lot of youngsters. Can I invite questions, one or two questions from? No questions. No. Rama, I am not an endoscopist, but I was surprised to discover that poem has not been, there has been no trials between poem and the old method of balloon dilatation. Does so, this strike you as something that's so I was just commenting on poem today that, you know, it went through the traditional phase of animal experimentation. So Pankaj J. Pasricha did a lot of work, animal work, which was probably actually the underpinnings for poem, but the Japanese went straight ahead and did it in the human, uh, with a human subject. So with endoscopy, I think sometimes it's okay. So the, I, I think there are going to be trials which compare poem. There is, there is. Rama. There are already trials which... Rama, there is a trial already published yes. between uh, poem versus pneumatic dilatation. Yes. Showing that poem is superior... It's a randomized controlled trial from Amsterdam which has shown that poem is superior to pneumatic dilatation. Uh, it's already in advanced stage of publication. It was the DW last year, so there's already a study. There's another study, poem versus... Uh, Heller's, Heller's my autobi. Which also yes. is completed showing similar efficacy. So yeah, both are sure. Yes, a question. Uh, thank you for the lecture, sir. My uh, question is actually more of a comment. I think we are making research in endoscopy more and more difficult with uh, trying to possibly ape the more developed countries. As an example, if as a standard of care, I'm taking an enteral biopsy, which is clinically indicated in a patient. 
And now I want to use this data for a research. The, the biopsy is indicated, the patient pays for it. But the very fact that I am going to use this data for publication means that I cannot charge this patient. So either I consent the patient for a biopsy which, he, which is as it is clinically indicated, if I want to use that data, any complication which accrues from this patient for next 30 days is, is possibly even though maybe totally illogical extrapolated to the original procedure. So we have sort of in our ethics committee, a, the, uh, try to be so, uh, so righteous that we are actually uh, uh, sort of snubbing out innovation and little bit of research which I think I could have done in my busy practice. Uh, Vikram, I totally agree with you but uh, basically I, I think this is what I said that we need to sensitize ethics committee members but it's also about prospective versus retrospective. Retrospective you don't need to worry that you charge your patient. No, prospectively I want to yeah. look at say 100 <laughs> patients of dyspepsia who are undergoing US and see whether US is picking up something fruitful in them. Now the very fact that now this data collection is for a publication purpose means that the procedure has to be free, a separate consent has to be taken even though I am doing nothing off the record. They are coming to me for this indication and I am just collecting their data in a prospective manner in a pre-filled performer. But then our rules and limitations sort of uh, seem to pull me in every direction so as to hinder or make my job more difficult. That's actually I think what is in a country like India keeping small studies from coming up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you Rama for that wonderful talk. We now move on to the next uh, presenter. We have Dr. VGM and he'll be speaking to us on the capture, storage and reproduction of quality images and... Uh, and videos. Over Most to respected chairpersons and my dear friends, it's a great honor indeed to be here in the centennial celebration of CMC Velo Department of Gastroenterology. So, uh, can we move on? Okay. Yeah. So, I was asked to speak on how to capture, store, reproduce quality images and videos in endoscopy uh, by Dr. Sudipto and it's equally a perplexing, perplexing field for me because I'm not a technician, uh, you know, who's knowledgeable in this field but still I tried to put up some of the slides on this area. So, why should we first capture endo images at all? First, we have to document our procedures and ability to provide assistance through teleendoscopy, sharing new techniques with a wider audience in workshops or via internet and for monitoring the quality of endoscopy examination. So today it becomes uh, mandatory, for example, doing a colonoscopy in the United States, people want to know whether you reached the cecum or not, so and whether did you miss out any polyps. And I saw this in Japan in 1987 when I went to Kyoto Prefectural University. At that time they were taking uh, snapshots of the endoscopy and then after finishing the endoscopy they went and sat in the computer looking at the 50, 60 images that they took just to see if they missed out any small polyp or any uh, early gastric cancer. So monitoring quality of endoscopic examination, providing second options, uh, second opinions and also for training and patient education. So this is one of those examples uh, of a case uh, where we recorded, can you fast forward it? Yes. This is endoscopy and uh, you know like uh, there have been calculi and this is dye spilling out and now we are past the spy glass, spy cholangioscopy and then uh, we are doing laser lithotripsy uh, in our unit and you can see the uh, brilliant uh, image that is produced by the spy DS so that now uh, the technology is so good and if you have a good HD capturing then you can store it and you can reproduce it for all teaching purposes. So this is one of those uh, poem training sessions and uh, you see uh, uh, Dr. Mohan uh, with us in this team and uh, then uh, behind is Dr. Vamshi and then Dr. Asif, my daughter Madhura and Dr. Sangamesh, all four of them uh, working with me and uh, now Vamshi moved to uh, uh, Vizag. So now training. Uh, sessions have become really beautiful because uh, you know you can uh, see it on a broad screen, wide screen so teaching has become easy as uh, Dr. Nagi was uh, showing his experience first you have to look into the uh, eyepiece of the fiber optic endoscope it used to be a pain and teaching was very difficult. I'll show you an example of 50 year old female who came with bloating, nausea and 
vomiting stale food at times and this is how we uh, in our institute we just record all the uh, patient data electronically and then uh, it is all ICD coded so and we can look here we have just uh, removed the name of the patient so this is very important if you are going to present it some in some workshops or conferences you're going to publish you should block the name of the patient and now today uh, dr sudipto was again pointing out a lot of youngsters just pass on all the videos and uh, you know still images in whatsapp groups even without blocking the names which is probably not the right way to do so this uh, uh, this uh, lady had a t half of gastric emptying 303 minutes and uh, this is the scintigraphy and then we what we did was a uh, g poem uh, uh, and this is the g poem you see the uh, you know the video which is uh, very clear and uh, just doing the mucosal incision and uh, getting it to the submucosal plane So when uh, Mohan Ramchandani was standing with us, we could do anything because the master was behind us. So that was a great uh, opportunity for us to work on this case. And uh, this is the submucosal dissection, which is very clear. And then the mucosal, uh, I mean the muscular incision also will follow. So the myotomy and uh, this is a myotomy so if you have a good recording then you can teach this is uh, the day after the procedure when uh, the patient could uh, swallow the barium within 45 minutes it was already in the ileum so this is remarkable improvement so so for teaching it's very very useful if you have a good HD recording so what about regulations and guidelines do we have any guidelines uh, that regulators so this is a paper published in uh, surgical endoscopy in 2012 on implications of law on video recording in clinical practice and this is what they said practical implementation of these principles in video recording in healthcare does not exist until date nothing exists so this is a problem so the conclusion is that we need uh, practical regulations on video recording and but Innovations in uh, the video capture technology can make it anonymous without uh, the patient uh, or the operator knowing uh, from what source it came. So this is possible. I'll show you my experience in our hospital. And uh, this is another, uh, you know, uh, article published in Canadian Journal of Gastroenterology Hepatology in 2016 said patients have a positive view of digital recording and documentation process but the doctors are not because they're worried about medical legal problems and litigations I would encourage you to read this article uh, which appeared in uh, ASGE on uh, image management systems and uh, these are all the software that are available in the United States and this is a comparison and uh, in India we have a lot of them at least three four of them one of them is uh, the automed and uh, we have the uh, capture IT pro all of them can do good job and uh, this is a comparison uh, between the two that we made up so uh, we can always look in so when you are starting your own unit uh, please look into all these details of which will be compatible and would be able to deliver what you want and when you look at an image management system it has to enable you to capture an image store an image and label the digital still images and videos and image quality is very important because it depends on the resolution of the output so most of the new endoscopes have a HD output. Some of the older scopes have a SD, that is a standard definition output. So what about the resolution of the output? What about the DTR, which is the data transfer rate, and the method of compression? And the resolution, if you have uh, the SD, has only 640 by uh, 480 pixels, whereas the HD, you can get 1280 by 720. Some of them can be even higher. And SD compatible signals include the separate videos and composite videos and HD compatible signals include the DVI and the uh, SDI so uh, then data transfer rate how quickly can data be transferred is also important otherwise the whole process becomes slow and it's not efficient and compression is very very important because without compression just a one hour HD video requires 500 GB of space so which is impossible humanly so and uh, we have to compress the videos and then decompress when we want to see it and image formats can be in different formats like uh, bitmap or jpeg or tiff or others so these 
these formats vary in their quality of images, so you need to know what is the best for you. And video formats, again, I think MPEG-4 is supposed to be probably still uh, on top. And uh, storage and retrieval is important because you need to have computer hard drives, U USB, that is a universal serial bus storage devices, conventional digital video disk you can store, or external hard drives, or like in VGM, we store in the cloud. So all our videos and everything is on the cloud, including images. So we need the EMR, the ele electronic medical record system, to be integrated into the capture system and storage system so that uh, this is possible. And video editing, you have to have at least a 2 GB RAM and 100 GB of uh, disk space. So what have we done in our center? We have a, uh, provided a CPU with i3 into 64 processor, a 4 GB RAM, a hard disk with one terabyte and LED monitor uh, in the rooms with uh, of 18.5 inches and then SDI HD capture card, SDI cable and SDI recorder. So when you are looking at HD right from beginning to end, it has to be HD compatible, otherwise you lose images and they are not going to be good. So we need SDA cables, DVI cables and the HD recorder is the uh, heart where you store everything and then the capture card for making uh, printouts and this is how in our department it works. There are four ender theatres and two operation rooms. All the images converge to the SDA recorder in the electronic data processing room and from there it goes to the cloud through NAS or can go to the CPU for printouts. This is how our endo theatres look. This is uh, the endo theatre one has got a Pentax, old Pentax unit so it needs an interface from digital analog to SDI. So this is uh, provided in NDC2, which is colonoscopy room where we use Olympus 180, which is H HD. So 3 and 4 also have Olympus uh, 190, which are also HD, so we no need for conversion. And OT5 has got ERCP, which is again uh, along with uh, Spyglass and EUS, Olympus EUS, everything is HD compatible. And these are operating rooms. Uh, from where all the images uh, go on. So as we switch these machines, our uh, you know EDP room starts, the machine starts recording. As we switch off, it automatically switches off. Again, this is uh, digitally stored, so no one knows the name of the patient. Uh, only if you have the code number, then you can access it. So that is the uh, thing. This is how uh, we capture the images. These are the cards. This is the EDP room where all the images uh, converge and one small machine can record uh, nine theaters and uh, this is how it is and uh, the NAS and this in sitting in my room I can watch all the six room videos and I can keep interacting with them as they are doing their procedures just advising them what to do or what not to do. So this is possible today because of the technology and people today have even USB endoscopes which can be tagged on to the cell phone and you can watch your uh, this thing. So my friends, to summarize, image management systems are becoming an integral part of endoscopy units. Systems have evolved from SD to standard definition to high definition recording. Newer features, features allow for integration with the hospital, ambulatory centers, EMR system, as well as a remote access to centralized storing like in the cloud. And overall needs for a hospital or endoscopy unit needs to be taken into account before purchasing an image management system. I thank you for this very patient listening and this opportunity given. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Um, any questions? Um, how often have you faced this problem of losing data? Uh, I mean, we don't because, yeah, because see, we, cloud, no? we always push it up to the cloud. cloud. Mm -hmm. Unless it rains heavily, I yeah. ask my EDP manager if it rains, do we lose the data? Yeah, it says no. Because sometimes it has happened with us, you know, like some of the, I mean, once the hard disk crashes, then we lose the entire data. Because we, we should always have a, see, we are an NABH hospital, we should have a data uh, redress cell management also. So yeah. we need to have uh, storage of data in another, another place away from the institution. That is again uh, being a part of NABH, I'm sure even JCI, they want the data to be stored elsewhere. Since we have it uh, in the cloud, then there's no problem. Do you think it's compulsory to give a CD uh, format to the patient for a permanent record? Uh, I don't think so. It's not really mandatory because there's no law that governs it. Even in the United States, if you see all the reports, they don't give any printouts at all. It's just only uh, uh, typed matter that is given to the patient. But nevertheless, many patients, in that study, 90% of the patients wanted a copy, uh, you know. Any questions? 
Actually, uh, I think, Mohan Prasad, we really need to give the patient the complete report because I get a lot of four pictures. And I think if you have patients moving from place to place, even though it's not mandatory, is there any system of recording this so that he can carry it actually on his cell phone? Yeah, that, that's true, sir. We, we can, uh, in, uh, in VGM, we can give uh, everything on the cell phone also. And uh, we, we give them the EMR, uh, you know, they can log on to our EMR uh, at vgmhospital.com and then they ha get a OTP, one-time password, where they can view from any corner of the globe, they can view all the images and the videos of all therapeutic procedures, including capsule endoscopies, uh, you know, uh, all, all the rest, we give them uh, uh, in the form of a CD. So all the you know procedures we give them in the form of CD, but nevertheless we always give a printout, color printout, like I showed some time back, the still images. Uh, we give a color printout. Even the histopathology microscopy is given as a color printout for the past eight years in our unit. In, uh, that's excellent. No, I'm just wondering whether this should be made some, something that's a more general rule. Anyway, thank you very much. Do I thank one and all of you. Now I invite Dr. Naresh Bhatt to speak about managing endoscopic complications in individual practice. Thanks, uh, George. I'll try to be as brief as possible. We're close to dinner time. A basic problem with complications are several. One is, of course, from the patient's point of view, is suffering expenses, increased hospital stay, there are medical legal issues, the fear of getting sued, there is a new area, an aspect of violence against you and destruction of your hospital. But at the end of it, I think a lot of us feel a deep sense of guilt that we are responsible for uh, this problem. And believe me, this guilt can be quite serious. I have lost at least two professional colleagues who had complications and just went on to become bad alcoholics and died within a year thereafter. So guilt can kill, but being found guilty can be just as bad because it can kill and also make you much poorer. What we formulated in our unit several years ago uh, was a seven-point audit, which we originally formulated basically to audit a complication that occurred whether it was an endoscopy-related complication or a drug-related complication, and I'll share with you some of these issues. Because the first thing, of course, is, is to prevent a complication, and I think adequate training is a must, and I don't think there can be uh, any way that you can condone a complication that's done by someone who is not trained. And fortunately now that we have uh, a credentialing and privileging system in most hospitals, uh, which is reasonably robust. So the problem now is not really uh, the problem with untrained doctors, but really those of us who are trained and skilled how to prevent us from creating complications. The first important thing at this stage would be what is the indication for the procedure. And from the medical legal viewpoint, training and indication for procedure become the two most important things. If your indication for the procedure is valid, then half your problem is sorted out. If you have a complication in a procedure that is not indicated, I'm sure we find ourselves in deep trouble. Counseling and consent is of paramount significance. You must have a detailed counseling and documentation. You, that cons documentation must involve what are the risks for the procedure. And it's not general risk, it should be individualized for a patient. For example, if you have a young lady, undilated bile duct, and you're planning an ERCP for whatever reason, your complication rate should reflect that rather than the standard 1% or whatever it is. So it has to be appropriate for the procedure. And now a medical legal viewpoint, they take a very strong exception to say that a complication is well known. 
that's not good enough because he asked you, if you knew it was well known, what the hell did you do to prevent it? So you have to have what precautions you're taking and what other options are there for the patient apart from this procedure. This needs to be documented as well. The next thing, as I said, is anticipation. And this comes when you stratify your patient risk, you anticipate a problem. So if you have a young lady, undilated, you're planning to do an ERCP, post-ERCP pancreatitis is about 6%. So you've anticipated and then you take precautions and all of us know what those standard precautions are. And that needs to be documented and done. Equipment and personnel are extremely important. And as uh, Nagi said, you need to have good communication with the people. You have to have a good technician who is with you so that that communication is well understood. Otherwise, you can have catastrophic outcomes. So make sure that your equipment is in working order. You have appropriate equipment to the procedure. Don't take shortcuts. I know in the Indian scenario, it's the Jugad thing that is important. But yes, I guess we need to innovate a little, but you can't innovate to the detriment of patient safety. Checklist, Nagi brought this up, very important. If you have a problem in endoscopy room, you must have ways to deal with it. And of course, you must have a crash cart and other resuscitation equipment. Otherwise, you can never save yourself if you have a patient crashing on the endoscopy table. The problem with endoscopy complications are quite often they're extremely predictable. And because they're predictable, we can go through a simple checklist to prevent most of the complications that we anticipate. So what are the checklists that we usually do? And we have this documented on our consent forms is apart from the indication we have whether he's on antiplatelet drugs. Do we have we taken a detailed consent? Do we have, you know, sort of stratified what is his uh, ASA status, what are his comorbid illnesses, and then have we planned his sedation protocol? Again, equipment, of course, is important. Nagi brought that up in his talk as well. And once you've started the procedure, it's important to monitor this patient, and especially from the view of this sedation, whether his sedation is adequate or inappropriately more. So this also needs to be monitored and you need to have a documentation of this. We have clear guidelines. If someone is on antiplatelet drugs, you know what to do, but it's not important knowing what to do. You must have done it. So in your consent form, if the patient has been on antiplatelet drugs, you have to put a note, he was on antiplatelet drugs, he'll stop for five days. Or he's been on antiplatelet drugs, you're converted heparin and whatever. So that needs to be adequately documented for you to save yourself and also very important to prevent a problem. All of us talk about faith and they say faith is the most important thing and it's if, you, if you realize, uh, rely on faith, you can perhaps go the whole way. But that's not really true in endoscopy. That's all right for a sermon or a prayer but not at endoscopy because in endoscopy, <clears throat> you must have the total picture before you decide what you're going to do. For example, if you see a polyp which has got a thick stalk, you just don't go and resect it. Say you've got a thick stalk, there may be more than one vessel, there may be a big vessel, I want to deal with it. It's a flat polyp, I need to take precautions, I need to lift it up and then resect it. So before you rush and do something, evaluate, take whatever appropriate precautions and then do it and you'll have a better outcome. Today, it's no longer a complication if someone bleeds while you're doing a procedure. If someone has a perforation while you're doing a procedure, it's not necessarily a complication. It's a complication when you can't deal with it. So if you have your appropriate tools, you can minimize your complication rate and still have good outcomes. But on the other hand, if you're doing a polypectomy and don't have the skills or the tools to sort of manage the bleed or the perforation, then obviously you're opening yourself to problems. 
So this is a very important slide, is especially for the younger colleagues, is it's not really conquering the fear of complications, but practice the steps to prevent and become skilled to treat them. Your no problem, complications will occur, just like it's, you'll always have one cold day in Velour sometime. So complications are going to occur, and you must anticipate and be proficient in treating them. The last thing is how do you react to a complication? Very important, the response, the timing to response. You can't have a patient who says he's got pain after you've done a procedure and you say, okay, no problem, I'll come back and see him uh, later in the evening or tomorrow morning. No, he might have perforated. So if someone has problems, you need to certainly go and see him immediately, document what has happened. If he does not have a symptom, you still need to document that I have seen him and he's well. If he has problems, assess the seriousness and deal with it appropriately. You may want to get some imaging to diagnose a perf, whatever it is, and deal with it. Very important is to counsel the family adequately. And it's not just once, you may have to counsel them repeatedly during this crisis. Very important sometime is to take help from a colleague, maybe another colleague in your own department, or it may be a surgical colleague who will help you out and bail you out and sort of keep you away from the sort of fire and help you deal with this problem. Finally, a complication on the table or a death on table is perhaps the most difficult thing that one would face. And the first reaction of most of us would be, wish you had never done the procedure. Worse is to run away from the scene and tell your junior, you manage it, I have a meeting to attend. Yes, all of us would like to avoid that confrontation, but it's very important that you have your process in place, your indication should be documented clearly, risk, confounders, con comorbidity lessons, everything should be there, then you may still get out of it, you know, sort of reasonably safely. But if it does happen, my own recommendation is be honest. Be honest, look at the relatives in the eye and tell them, this is a problem that we had thought might happen, though if we have a small percentage, but unfortunately it has happened, and let us see how we can deal with it. Try to pretend it never happened, I think is the worst thing that you could do. Sit down, be patient, and let someone else take care of the patient while you counsel the family. But it's important to stay calm. A lot of times we get aggressive and when we are defensive. We are trying to defend a problem, we get aggressive and blame the patient for it. This is really the wrong approach. Always do your best even if you have had a complication. Most patients forgive you for a complication, but they'll never forgive you if you don't do your best. Nagi said you need to do things again and again and again to be good. But the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if you don't take corrective steps, if you don't audit what you're doing, your mistakes, you'll never correct yourself. And ultimately, you can't prevent someone from suing you. You may be right, everything may be correct, but the judge may always take a lenient view and says, poor chap, he died, let's give him a compensation of only 25 lakhs. What happens in our courts, you can't help it. Important that you must have a professional indemnity. Insure yourself heavily and make sure at least, even if you have done the right thing, you are coming out without guilt, you will not be sort of poor at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you, Naresh. Can you s hang, answer a few questions? Sure. Any questions from the audience? Yes, uh, sir. What is the ISGR societal take on the use of uh, homemade or local accessories? Because when you look at the DGCI's uh, list of approved accessories in the country, it amounts to 247 items in total. So many of the metal stents, the pseudocyst drainage, the catheters are sort of not approved by any agency, no quality check. 
we are only provided details by the vendor mainly the lower cost as the as the as the reason for choice so what is the societal guidance guidance or societal take on that two the societal take on reuse of accessories which we never consent the patient including fn and needles which are never consented so these may or will be a cause of lawsuit like the cardiology community today or tomorrow you are very right vikram you brought up a very sensitive issue unfortunately we have no uh, clear guidelines on any of these issues we have debated this especially on reuse of accessories and things like that but i don't think we have clear guidelines fortunately there has been no uh, ruling against this in uh, at least as far as gastroenterology is concerned but it is time we address this issue and came up with guidelines of course we need to be aware that in a country like ours you rightly brought out the problems of using western standards in publishing or research but i think we need to be aware about if you use western standards i don't think most of our patients will ever undergo a procedure at all our, so our, we need to have some kind of no point is our regulating authority has not even uh, approved a fraction of the accessories which we use we are counting on us fda approved accessories and most of the and many of the accessories are homemade not approved obviously by us fda neither by our local authorities yet we are using them right left and center so i think it's time the societal absolutely I, I some, some sort of sandeep is here is the secretary of the sgi i am sure uh, in the next three years we'll have something to work at and we'll be better than what we are today thank you thank you naresh thank you very much our final talk this evening is by dr ashok chako who is currently the director of the department of gastroenterology at the madras medical mission hospital in in chennai he is the right person to speak to us about training in interventional endoscopy having been the person who set up endoscopy in cmc velour and built it up plan training and then all that we have today is because of him thank you ashok we are waiting for your talk thank you george first i'd like to congratulate our young team uh, here today who have organized this meeting and they've done a great job <clears throat> also thank uh, amit who asked me to speak on training in advanced endoscopy it was i think in 2009 when i knew that i had just a couple of years or two three years to retire that i looked at my to do wish list which i have to do and realized that one of the things i wanted always to do was to start a fellowship or a program of training in advanced endoscopy and uh, from what i hear it's become popular now with a lot of applicants and some of them who have gone through are very happy with what they have so i once uh, amit told this to me i've been thinking about it what to speak on and i jotted down uh, some points uh, which i hope i will also be able to give some views or answers and some of them are from literature so is there a need for advanced endoscopy training fellowships in our country do all gastroenterologists need training in advanced endoscopy do we have a curriculum for training how adequate are existing models of training and assessment does the use of stimulators simulators translate into improved clinical outcomes how can gastroenterologists in practice obtain training in an advanced procedure does the trainer require training and what is the role of our society in regulating facilitating and maintaining high standards of advanced endoscopy training first is there a need for training yes definitely there is a need for training because in the 3 year of dm dnb program it is just not possible to train them in advanced endoscopy because advanced endoscopy comprises number of complex procedures which requires technical skill and steep learning curves and also these have got adverse events and without proper training adequate training i don't think uh, it should be done because it leads to complications so definitely there there is 
a need for this advanced training fellowship. In a US survey of graduating fellows, one third of respondents stated that they had an inadequate training in ERCP and more than half had inadequate training in EUS. They also said that more than 90% started performing ERCPs independently, which is actually unsafe with suboptimal training. The same thing is very, very true in our country because even after watching workshops or watching, uh, hardly spending a few days with a trainer, people go and do ERCPs and obviously it's going to lead to more adverse events. So definitely there is a need for a fellowship program. Do all gastroenterologists need to be trained in advanced endoscopy? So once they are at the third year, definitely they have to choose a career option or career focus. You can either be a general gastroenterologist doing basic endoscopy and looking at all gastro patients or choose one of the various subspecialities. But most young people, as soon as they finish or towards the end, they nearly all of them want to take up only advanced endoscopy. And what could be the reason? Because they feel that it maximizes their future marketability and career opportunities. I do not know whether, whether this is really true, as I will show you later. And they feel that it's a glamorous field. They feel they are the samurai or the gladiators of gastroenterology. I also always feel they should also think that it's only the top gladiators who survive, the others fall by the wayside. So there are certain points I would like that people, young people, to ponder while choosing a career in advanced endoscopy. I think they should introspect and determine their strengths and weaknesses. They should see whether they have really the ability, the talent to pursue this field. Also, they should realize there are limited employment opportunities because you need to, you, it, uh, people who can employ you are only those at large centers where you can be supported with infrastructure and case volumes. You cannot go anywhere or a suburban area and start working uh, there because you need uh, budgets, you need more money to buy your infrastructure and case volumes to support you. They also will have a stressful life because advanced endoscopy has higher complication rate, higher, higher litigation rates, and therefore the life will be not so peaceful. What about financial implications? Advanced endoscopy does not necessarily equate to higher income. The time consuming advanced procedures reimburse less per time spent compared to standard endoscopy procedures. So I think uh, when uh, one wants to take up a career in advanced endoscopy, they should actually have a genuine passion for the discipline, as well as the talent and ability. Only if they have these two should they take up this field. And I think it's the duty of the mentors and teachers who look at their uh, trainees to guide them. They see their strengths and weaknesses and they are the best people to guide them as to take up what they are good at. What about curriculum? We really don't have a curriculum, a uniform curriculum. It's only an ad hoc curriculum from center to center. And a curriculum should actually need, have cognitive training, technical training, and an integration of both these. And I think all advanced training should include ERCPs and EUS. And there are so many other techniques, all of which cannot be taught in one year, and that takes time. And depending on what they plan to take up in future, they can learn a few techniques, and the rest can be learned as they go along. What about training and assessment? The training model that is found in our country and most places is an apprentice model where trainees go along with their trainer or practicing endoscopist and learn during the course of managing patients. And how are they, how is competency determined? 
it is usually by minimum number of procedures. Uh, most societies have a certain number of ERCPs or EUS, et cetera, et cetera. And if you do those minimum numbers, they certify competence. Or a global impression by the trainer, okay, you're good enough, you can go and start doing. But is that uh, good enough? Because trainees develop competence at different volumes. Uh, some people require a certain number to develop competence, others require much more. So just volumes alone doesn't equate with competence. For example, the ASG guidelines for EUS says you should have done 150 supervised procedures and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And for ERCP it's around 200 procedures. And recent uh, study on the learning curve for EUS among 12 trainees using a Kusum analysis and uh, any, anybody who comes below this line are competent. Out of the 12, uh, when you look at 150 numbers, none of them are competent. It's only when you reach about 230, 240 that two of the 12 reach competence. And even by almost 300, 10 of the 12 have not reached competence. So different trainees reach competence at different levels. Again, showing that minimum numbers is not enough to decide competence. So there's another training model called competency-based model. And uh, here the training is to achieve competency in specific goals. For example, if you want to say you're competent in ERCP, they, they will have to have successful cannulation rates of the duct of interest in about 80 to 85 percent, a clearance of CBD stone of less than one centimeter and more than 90 percent, or a biliary uh, stent placement uh, when the obstruction is below the bifurcation in more than 90 percent. So you have certain goals and uh, once you reach those goals uh, regularly, then you say that you are competent. Competence should also be cognitive competence. And what about assessment? Uh, this assessment is of the competence of the person. And if they are not competent, the reason for incompetence is explained to the trainee, retrained, reassessed, and this goes on till adequate competency is acquired in that specific skill. Now, should trainers be trained? I think what is automaticity? When a skill is developed and no longer requires conscious thought for efficient performance, this is termed automaticity, like riding a bicycle or swimming. Uh, once you learn how to ride a bicycle or swim, uh, you don't think about it. You don't think about the steps that went into it. It automatically comes. Endoscopy is also like that. Once you learn a technique, it is automatic. You don't think of the various steps. This is a problem for teachers because many endoscopists find it easier to take a scope from the learner's hand and do it themselves and then show how it is done rather than being able to take steps to, to, to perform the procedure. So if you want to teach, you need to break up the task into subtasks. And only if you can do that, you can explain to the candidate or the trainee how to do the procedure. And that is conscious competence. So trainers need uh, train the trainer workshops where they learn how conscious competence uh, can be taught to the trainee. They also how to, so how to do the training schedule, ethics, safety, many factors have to be learned. So I think it's important that the trainers also be trained when they undertake this role. What about simulators? It's not very popular in training programs because of cost concerns. I think Nagi told us how expensive they are. And also, uh, there is a paucity of evidence that these simulators make a difference in training outcomes. So it's really not popular. So just uh, to summarize the training, I just need a couple of minutes. The curriculum in the current state is ad hoc, whereas in the ideal state, 
you need a proper curriculum. Training model in the ideal state should be competent-based. Trainer needs formal training. Assessment, it's better to be competency-based rather than volume-based. Time in training, outcomes, uh, right now it is assessed near the end, whereas it's better to have a continuous assessment so that corrections can be done. What about endoscopists in practice? They cannot take off and spend a an year trying to learn. And for them, I think short-term training courses with experts, with competence assessment and certification can be carried out. What about the deficiencies, limitations of our training programs? As I mentioned, lack of a curriculum. The trainers are not trained to teach. Variable assessment strategies, variable infrastructure and case volumes at different places. And the other is commercialization of advanced endoscopy training. I think in our country, the whole of medicine is commercialized. So I think it may be a good idea not to commercialize the advanced endoscopy training in our country. And finally, the role of SGEI, they should actually take an active role. They should form a credentialing committee to inspect and approve centers where uh, advanced endoscopy is to be started. They should uh, develop a curriculum which is uniform for the whole country, tr conduct the train the trainers courses, and on their website they should display details of the accredited centers so that candidates can apply for fellowship training looking at that. So in conclusion, my friends, as uh, an advanced endoscopy cannot be taught during a three-year program, uh, it is necessary to have these fellowships in our country so that candidates will not be under-trained while they do these procedures. All gastroenterologists do not need training in advanced endoscopy. They have to have passion and they have to have talent and ability. Uh, training should be, uh, they should set goals and trainer should achieve, make the trainee achieve these goals and assessment should be on competence-based rather than volume-based. Trainers may be excellent endoscopists but not good teachers. Therefore, there is a good need, important need to train the trainer, to have trained the trainer workshops where they are trained, where they are taught the art of teaching. And uh, SGAI should regulate and facilitate advanced endoscopy training in India, as I mentioned, by the various ways. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok, for an exhaustive talk on the training that we need in advanced endoscopy. Uh, any questions? How do you apply for how do you apply for the course here in CMC? <laughs> you set it up. <laughs> no, it's just like you apply for any other course. Like you have to send applications and then interviews and uh, one year, two years, one year program. One year program. One year program. So you want. Somebody you wanted to. And how many of your trainers have been trained, Ashok? <laughs> uh, I think we should ask KJ that. I don't. <laughs> Mohan, sir, the, sir, excellent presentation, sir. So actually, what I was thinking was during the three-year DM period itself, on the third year, uh, we can start objectively interacting with our fellows and uh, find out. Are they interested in luminal gastroenterology or hepatology or therapeutic endoscopy? Ultimately, it has to be one of the three. So then the push can be given for those candidates even on the third year. Instead of saying the advanced fellowship uh, to start only post-DM, I thought after two years of DM, the third year itself they can branch off, subspecialize and start uh, you know, getting focused in, uh, in, in their chosen sub-speciality. Yeah, we actually thought about it uh, when, we, when I was here. Uh, one of the things is, uh, when you ask six candidates, uh, what would you like to subspecialize? All six say they want advanced endoscopy. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't put all six of them into that. You need to, so it's very difficult at that point. Uh, the second is, that, so it's difficult because all of them want to do the same no, thing. No, if we have some objective assessment models, 
where you know like uh, you can even it can be robotic assessment like on hand eye coordination and how skilled is going to be in endoscopy we, we can get a counseling done that you're not going to be great in uh, uh, therapeutic endoscopy so why don't you take luminal gastroenterology actually That's in the important. final year they are given they have postings both in ERCP and EUS uh, it is uh, the thing is uh, no uh, what you say is very correct that it happens usually after the after the Post DM, DM. Uh, DM, yes. they come and some so everybody just, wants to do this but once they come in and then they start creating problems then you tell them that look here you're good at something else but this may not be your line why don't you take that it's happened and they've done very well in the line that they went into sir i think that happens in cmc bellor but not everywhere it doesn't happen everywhere. I don't think now the youngsters will listen to the bosses. Yeah, that's true. That's why many of the <laughs> teachers feel that they don't listen to them at all. So maybe, you know, if there is an objective way of assessment, then, you know, like you can say that, look, yeah. you are not destined to be like Nageshwar Reddy, you know, like <laughs> that sort of hand skill. Thank you. In, any other questions? Maybe Amit, uh, AG and Co, this is fantastic what you've done. Thank you, Ashok, for an excellent Thank talk. You. I think we, uh, yeah, let's put our hands together and say. Thank you, sirs and ma'am. Uh, if you could all join us outside now, we'll take a photo, uh, followed by dinner in Ben's Park at 7.30.